Hi everyone, I hope you are as excited as I am for another week of Movement Church Online. There's so many things that you could be doing right now, but you have made the choice to commit this time to growing in your relationship with Jesus. Thank you for making this a priority. And our hope for you each and every week is that something that is said will help you in your relationship with Jesus. This series has been designed with that goal in mind. And so we've got a great service ahead of us with week four of Resistance. But before we get into it, I am thrilled to be able to share some exciting news. Starting next week, Sunday, July 4th, we will have the return of in-person experiences for Movement Kids. If you are the parent of a child who is in kindergarten through fifth grade, we would love to see them in person in addition to our in-person Little Movers environment. And on top of that, a great reason to join in the fun next week is we're beginning a brand new series talking about family called Family in the Roaring Twenties. Now, let's begin our final week of our series, Resistance. Well, to quickly review where we've been in this series, there's always more at stake when you are tempted. Every time you're tempted, and we all face temptation on a, on a weekly, daily, maybe hourly basis, far more than we would like to admit. Every time you're tempted, your future, your family, and your faith are on the line. And so because the stakes are high, we've been learning how to face temptation, how to resist temptation, how to grow our resistance against temptation, because some of us may not have actually known this, but you can resist temptation temptation. And we actually can get better at resisting temptation. So we've been learning how to fight the core temptations that we all face. And we've, we've talked about the temptation to meet a legitimate need in an illegitimate way. That we've learned that we can trust God to close the gap. And we learned last week that when we're tempted to use God as a means to our own ends, we should remember, we must remember that we were made to cooperate, not to manipulate God, not to try to twist God's arm, not to try to talk God into the things that we want to do, but to simply try to understand what God would have us do and to cooperate with that. Now today, as we wrap up the series, I want to talk specifically, especially um, to the people who love progress, um, to those of you who are never satisfied with the way that things are going in life, those of you who are especially driven, uh, maybe those of us who have perfectionistic tendencies, um, those for whom life, let's be honest, it comes with a scorecard and it comes with a scoreboard and you know at any given moment where you stack up against the people that you're surrounded with or against other family members, against people who you're, who you're trying to do life with, you view life as a little bit of a conversation. Competition. This can be full-grown adults where, where we all know there's certain, uh, certain industries that attract ultra-competitive individuals where it's win at all costs, advance at all costs, get, pro get promoted at any and all costs. This can also be kids or teenagers or college students who have those ambitious plans for the future and you've met some of them, maybe some of you have been them, maybe some of you are them right this very moment where you tell everyone exactly what you're going to do, where you're going to go for undergrad, where you're going to go for graduate school, how you're going to apply for this program and this, and this job option. Play, this job opportunity where you know they have tens of thousands of applicants every year, but only four people actually get the job, but you're going to get one of them because you have a plan and XYZ and XYZ and, and, and ABC and all these kind of different things. And when you're, when you as a driven parent or driven adult hear these people, these young people talk, sometimes you go, hold on, I'm, I'm driven, but you need to take a breath. Like you need to take a beat. Um, this can, all, this can be moms and dads who are very ambitious with their children. Your kids have to be better than other people's children. Like sometimes when you get around your kids as friends or the, you know, or the people, the other kids that your friend, that your kids like spending time with, you're you're secretly like watching, and you're like, oh, you got a smile on your face, but your smile is really because little Jamie is struggling with her vowels, and you go, oh, that's just so sad. Oh, like why are you smiling? I don't know. I'm just really sad about that. Like you're like you're secretly rejoicing that your kid has the vowels figured out. This can be parents with their with their kids. This can be spouses. This is, can be husbands and wives who secretly always have an agenda, always have ambitious goals for their spouse, which all 
always works out well, by the way, to have to have some goals for your spouse. That, that always works out well. It can be related to your career where you're always looking for the next stepping stone or the opportunity to move up the ladder. Um, it can be related to your finances where hustle culture has become increasingly, increasingly prominent. You're always, always working in, in order to improve your financial conditions. There is no rest. It's constant work, constant work, constant work. I actually have an acquaintance, um, uh, someone I, I went to Bible school with who right now is very much in the, in the, in the middle of hustle culture. He recently shared on Facebook how he took out a, a loan for a second vehicle um, because he's been driving for Uber for a few years and, and he was starting to get some negative reviews on Uber about his vehicle. So he took out a loan for $400 a month uh, to buy a second vehicle for himself to drive around as his Uber vehicle because while he's working for Uber, he could work, he could earn where he lives, he could earn $400 a week and paying $400 a month to earn $400 a week in his mind was a super great bargain, a super great deal, a super investment. That's what hustle culture is. And here's the thing. And here's the thing. If, if, you're, if you're a Christian and you've got that in you, like I've got that in me, every once in a while we stop and we look in the mirror and we go, is that like, like, should that stuff be in us? Should that perfectionism and that drive and that ambition, like, should that stuff actually be a part of us as a Christian? And if, th and if that's you, there is, there's some good news as we talk today. God is an actively creative God. In creation, God created and God proved that in, in vivid detail. God likes seeing things through to completion. God didn't stop at day three of creation. He didn't go like, well, Things are going pretty good here. You know, let's let's see how, how this all goes. Like he saw the job through to completion. God loves progress. Progress happened at creation, and God continued revealing Himself in ever clearer ways to the nation of Israel and throughout the history of Israel, and ultimately up until the life of Jesus. God has been progressively showing Himself in, in clear and clear and clear ways. God loves leadership and God loves excellence. That's why in Romans 12, God spoke through the Apostle Paul to say, if your gift is leadership, lead and and lead with all diligence. I mean, like God loves excellence and leadership. God's all for that. There's nothing inherently wrong or ungodly with wanting progress and productivity and excellence. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. At the same time, if that's in you like that's in me, this sets us up to continuously face the third core temptation that we talked about from the very beginning. And that temptation is the, is the urge to pursue the right thing at the wrong time in the wrong way or take a shortcut. It's the urge to pursue the right thing at the wrong time in the wrong way or to take a shortcut. And here's what I mean by that. We can all get so focused on the things that we have our eye on, a, a, a vision, a dream, our purpose, our calling, our career, productivity, creativity, financial security, that we would be willing to take a shortcut to get there. In other words, we get our eyes on the right thing, but we would do the wrong thing in the wrong way at the right wrong time. We would get outside of the will of God in order to pursue what we believe to be the right thing. It's the opportunity that presents the chance to take a giant step forward, but to take that giant step forward, you have to make a small compromise on something that you value. To temporarily check your morality, check your integrity, check your values, check your ethics, check your faith at the door for an hour, for a day, or for a week, or for a season of time, and then you think you'll pick it back up because that's what, what you'll do. You'll check it for a season in order to take this step, and once you've taken the step, you'll pick it back up. It's a great job opportunity. But just to give a few examples, it's a great job opportunity, but the requirements are a college degree or a certain level of work experience, and you think, well, well, I, well I, I finished a lot of college. I finished like most of college, and, and that counts, so you, you, so you count it, and you put it on the resume, and you think there's no chance they're actually going to call on this, and they probably won't, and you think that, or, or, or you pad your application with some extra years of experience that you don't have, and you think it's such a great opportunity, and after all, everyone lies on their resume. No, one, no one's fully honest on their resume. It's, it, or you're, you're on the work trip with the new company and all the guys are talking about hitting a gentleman's club after the day at the conference. You want to fit in, but you think those places are gross. And so to get where you want it with influence at the company, you think you might actually have to turn off your morality a little bit in order to hang out with the boys and, and to gain acceptance from the boys and gain influence 
with the boys, or maybe you're a newlywed and you have an issue with how much your husband drinks. You knew he liked to drink before you got married, but you didn't know how much and how often he likes to drink. And there's something in you that you know that knows you should say something because it's, it bothers you and you think it's going to continue to bother you. But when you say anything at all, he kind of blows up and you think, well, I could say something or I could have a peaceful home. I mean, I, I won't be peaceful inside, but I'll have a peaceful home. So I could say something or have a peaceful home. I guess I'll just stay quiet forever. Like, like for uh, how long do I need to stay quiet? Or, you know, if it, maybe as a teenager, you think like, I need to make some new friends. I'm at a new school. I'm at a new place. I need to make some new friends. So I'll laugh at all those jokes that aren't funny. And then someone opens a, a, a bottle of something that, that, they, that they give to you. And you're thinking, well, everyone around me is doing this. I, I, I don't think I should be doing this. But in order to keep the group of friends, I think I'm going to have to do this in order to stay here. In order for them to accept, I think I'm going to have to do what they're doing. And so, and so you take, I've got, you know, I, 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 in order to, to keep the friends that I'm making, I'll just, I'll just do this for a little bit. See, in each of these cases, the temptation is to play by their rules, put down your values, put down your morals, put down your faith, and then sometime down the road, you think you'll pick that stuff back up again. You'll pick up your faith. You'll pick up your morals. You'll pick up your ethics. You'll pick up your standards. You'll pick all of that up again. That's what we all think we'll do. We'll lay it down to get there, to, keep, to get the job, to fit in, to keep everyone happy, to make friends, to keep peace in the home. And then once I'm there, though, I'll pick my morals up, pick my faith back up, pick my values up, pick my standards back up, and I will be a great witness. I will be able to give more because of what I'm making at my job. I'll be a great example to the friends who got me to do all this stuff that I shouldn't be doing in the first place. I'll turn around and be a great example. And when you face that temptation, let me just tell you something that you should know that we don't often know in the face of temptation. What you have to lay down to get there usually has to stay down to keep you there. What you lay down to get you there usually has to stay down to keep you there. You don't get to just pick it back up and everything stays the same. You don't get to just pick back up your morals and pick back up your faith and pick back up your standards and keep everything that you, that you got when you laid it down acceptance changes, influence changes. The moment when you, like you, like you don't, we think we can just pick it back up and everything stays the same. But what you know from your, your life's experience is that you don't just get to pick it all back up. What you laid down to get there often has to stay down in order to keep you there. So here's the other thing that we need to understand. In that moment of, of decision, in that moment of temptation, in that moment of decision, you will ultimately find out who you really are and you'll find out whose you really are. You will find out who you really are and whose you really are. Again, as we've said throughout this series, there's always more on the line than we think when we're tempted. It's not just a drink, not just a night with coworkers, not just a hot topic with your new spouse. The ultimate question is, can you trust your heavenly father to get you where he wants to get you the way that he plans to get you there and intends to get you there at the time that he plans and intends to get you there? Can you hold on to everything that ultimately matters and trust that God will still see you through, or do you have to take matters into your own hands? The good news, once again, is that Jesus faced this exact temptation. The third temptation that Jesus faced was this exact temptation. In Matthew chapter 4, what we're told starting in verse 8, after Jesus had been tempted two times already by the devil, we're told this in verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. Now, we have no idea how this happened. Like, we don't know if the devil had early access to a Virgin Galactic ship. I mean, Virgin Galactic, by the way, let me just say this, Virgin Galactic, we are open to paid sponsorships right now. We are open to becoming the, the official church of Virgin Galactic. If you're looking for a church to sponsor, if you're looking for a church to, 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 to be your official partner, we are up for that. Give us a call, okay? Like, we, we, we don't know, we don't know exactly how this happened. Today, actually, this wouldn't even really be all that miraculous. Because from your laptop or from your phone, you can take virtual tours of literally everywhere on the planet. Like, I wouldn't recommend doing this, but right now you could actually turn this off and take a virtual tour of like all seven wonders of the world. Like, you could do that from your couch right now, you lazy bums. Like, you could do that. Like, you, like you can just do it. Like, you don't have to go there. You don't have to take a plane there. You can view it all on your phone. You can view it all on your laptop. You can view all the stuff of the world from your, from your phone. But from this point in time, we don't know exactly how, how this happened, but the devil showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world, all the kingdoms of the world, all the beauty and wonder and extravagance and kingdoms that the world had to offer. And he said this in verse nine, all this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. 
All this I will give you, he said, if you'll bow down and worship me. In other words, from Satan's perspective, hey, Jesus, I'll, 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 if you'll submit to my authority, I'll give you even more authority than you could ever have right now. If you submit to my authority, if you'll bow down and recognize my authority, I'll give you even more authority. And to that, we actually, we, we, we maybe would wonder, well, why is this even a temptation? Like, bow down to the devil? Of course not. No way. I'm not going to bow down to the devil. Like, like, when we hear this, this is the one where we go, yeah, that's easy. No one would bow down to the devil. But what's being offered to Jesus is deeply connected to the very reason that Jesus came to earth. See, at creation, God gave mankind authority over all creation, naming the animals. He, they were this, we were supposed to be the stewards of creation. We, we were supposed to have authority and influence and be the stewards, the caretakers over all creation. When mankind fell to temptation in the Garden of Eden, they handed over authority to the tempter. See, there's always more at stake. It wasn't just an apple. There's always more at stake than we think and than we, than we recognize when we're tempted. When mankind fell to temptation, we gave authority and handed authority back over to, back to the tempter. Part of Jesus' mission on earth was to take back the authority that had been given away. This is why, this is why after, the, after the cross, when Jesus is giving his disciples the Great Commission, he actually begins with the phrase, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Not because I bowed down to Satan, not because I bowed down to the devil in the wilderness a couple years ago, but because I went to the cross and I won it and I took it back. And I won it when I came out of the, out of the empty grave, when I, after I paid for your sins and I offered you, like, and I came out bringing new life for everyone. All authority has been given to me. This is deeply con connected to the reason that Jesus came to earth. With his death and his resurrection, Jesus would win authority on heaven and earth. Satan offered it to him without the pain and without the bloodshed of the cross. He offered him, in other words, he offered him a shortcut to his purpose. He offered him a shortcut to the very reason he had came. He offered him a shortcut to the authority that, he, that, he, that he'd come to take back. He offered a shortcut. If Jesus was just willing to lay down that, that concern for humanity and lay down that whole paying for our sins part. In the moment, see, in the moment, we think the issue is the thing we have our minds and our hearts set upon. That's not the real issue. The issue in the face of that temptation, in the face of that urge, the issue is our peace. The issue is our ability to lay our head down at night knowing that we're exactly where and who God created us to be. Because those of you who have been down this road, unfortunately, what you have learned is that when you compromise, you gain the thing that you wanted often, but you lose the feeling of intimacy with your heavenly father. In other words, you're not sure that he's with you anymore. You're where you feel like he wanted you to end up, but you're not sure that he's with you because of the way you compromise on the way to get there. The moment that you ignore God to get where God wants you to be, you have this nagging feeling of, I'm here, but I'm not sure that he's here with me anymore. See, the issue is not the scholarship. It's not the deal. It's not the purchase. It's not the drinks. It's not the date. It's not whatever. The issue is can and will you trust your heavenly father that he can get you where he wants you to go, how he wants you to get there, without compromising what, he, what he's instilled in you as, in your faith and your values and your morals and your standards. Can you trust your heavenly father to get you where he wants you to go in his timing, in his plan, in his will, and in his ways? Or do you have to take matters into your own hands and take a shortcut and operate in the wrong way to get to what you think is the right thing and operate at the wrong time to get the right, what you believe to be the right thing? See, what we need to remember is this, and what Jesus ultimately remembered was this, is that you will never accomplish the will of God by abandoning the principles of God. You will never accomplish the will of God by abandoning the principles of God. Let me go one step further. You will never maintain the blessings of God by ignoring the instruction of God. To break this down into, into, into some, of, some of the way we, we operate in our world. Parents, you don't end up with godly kids by ignoring God's plan for how things should work in the family. That's a little teaser and a spoiler for next week, by the way. Like parents, we don't get godly kids who love the church and love Jesus and serve the world around them by ignoring God's plan for how the family should ultimately work physically. You don't end up with a healthy body while ignoring God's command to honor God with your body. 
financially, financially, you don't end up with God's blessing on your finances when you ignore God's plan for your finances. Like, like this is just one of those things. Like, we don't ultimately get the blessing of God. We don't, we don't achieve and accomplish the will of God by ignoring, by ignoring what God would actually have us do by abandoning the principles of God. And so Jesus understood this. That to take the shortcut would be to rush ahead to a place where God would not sustain him. Jesus, again, once again, went back to the beginning of the nation of Israel, went back to the wilderness because he found himself in a wilderness. He went back to the wilderness once again to to Moses' message to the people of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 6. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, before the nation's headed again, again, before they're headed into the, into the promised land, Moses wanted them to remember who God had been, what God had done, and what they ultimately needed to remember about God as they were about to enter the land that God had promised them. In verse 10 of Deuteronomy chapter 6, we're told, When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large, flourishing cities that you did not build, Houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Fear the Lord your God. This is the last verse. Fear the Lord your God and serve him only. In other words, Moses said, once you get to the promised land, your temptation will be to establish yourself and prove yourself as more than a slave nation and more than some random tribe and think, well, God, that God stuff got us here. It got us through the wilderness, but it's not going to help us settle this new land. It's not going to turn us into a country. It's not going to turn us into a nation. It's not going to carry us any further. He said, in other words, like, like you're going to think now it's the time to start acting like a nation. Now it's the time to start building an army. Now it's the time to think about how to protect ourselves and everything we have, everything that you know, someone else got us in the first place. It's time to start thinking about all of that. And Moses knew that in the, fa- in the face of an urge to trade what's ultimate for what is ultimately important, for what, sorry, what, for what feels important, he said, remember, he who brought you here will get you there. He who brought you here will get you there. There, you're going to think about a whole bunch of other stuff that you think you have to abandon God in order to get that stuff. But Moses said, I want you to remember in the face of that temptation, the one who brought you through the wilderness, he's the one who will carry you into the promise. The one who brought you out is the same one who will take you in. The one who provided in the wilderness is the same one who will provide in the promised land. The one who sustained you on the move is the one who will sustain you when you settle. He brought you in. He'll keep you in. You trust him. You follow him. You are not your own source. You have no other source. He is your source. Trust him to be your source. And so in Matthew when Jesus is confronted to take a shortcut, when Jesus is tempted to take a shortcut to reach his purpose that God had sent him for in a way that God had not sent him for, in a way that God had instructed him not, not to take, to take a shortcut, to take a, to take a wrong turn, to, to try to get there faster, to try to get there without some of the, the pain and the, and the difficulty of the cross. In the face of that temptation, Jesus goes back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, and he says, Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. In other words, I'm not going to take a shortcut. I'm not, I, like, I, I understand what you're trying to get me to do, but I'm not going to bow down to your authority to try to gain authority. I'm going to follow God. I'm going to trust that God is my source. I'm going to trust that God has a will, that God has a way, and that that is God's will and that God's way. But getting there this way is not God's will and not God's way, so I'm not going to take it. I'm not going to take a shortcut. And then it says, the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. See, do you, do you know what, what Jesus wanted more than all the kingdoms in, on, of the earth? He wanted unbroken fellowship with his heavenly Father. Do you want to know what Jesus got? Both. He got got unbroken relationship and fellowship with his heavenly father, and he got all authority in heaven and on earth. You know what we get when we trade what's ultimate for for what we feel is important? Neither. Neither. 
Because Jesus was willing to follow the will and the way of his heavenly Father, he ended up with unbroken fellowship with his heavenly Father and all authority in heaven and on earth. When we trade what's ultimate, what's ultimately important, our relationship with our heavenly Father, our faith, our standards, what God has done in us, when we trade that for what seems important and what seems urgent in a moment, we end up with neither. We end up ditching our relationship with God and we often end up missing the very thing that we gave it up for in the first place. You know what's true for you? If you'll follow Jesus' lead and resist the urge to take the shortcut, God provides. God sustains. God sees you through. God works in you and around you and through you and for you. When you trust God's will, God makes a way. When you trust God's will, God makes a way. When you trust God's plan, God provides. When you trust God's plan and his will and his leadership and his lordship and his authority in your life, you have peace and confidence that God is with you as he leads you to the things and the places that he has for you in his ways and in his timing. You can trust him. When you trust God's will, God makes a way. And the opposite is true as well. When you step out of God's will, his provision, and his protection go away. When you step out of God's will, his provision and his protection go away. When you take matters into your own hands, when you take the shortcut, when you drop the morals, and when you check your faith, you lose that peace and you lose that confidence and you miss out on the provision and there is no way anymore. And everything that you would thought would work out tends to go dry. And every door you thought would be open tends to be a, a door that's shut in your face. What you thought was the solution only caused more problems because they were never meant to have everything in you because you were never meant to have everything in your hands and you were never meant to be your only source and they were never meant to be your source. And that job was never meant to be your source. You were meant to have one source with your heavenly Father. And so here's the thing. A few years ago, when I, when I, or when I was thinking about this, a story came to mind. A few years ago, um, we had some friends when we lived in Alamogordo. It was a family that was older than both Jalen. The, the parents were older than both Jalen and I. They had some wonderful kids that were, part of, that were part of our church. We loved this family. They served in, in different areas throughout the church. I mean, they were super heavily, heavily involved. We, we loved, loved this family. Um, and, and after knowing them for a number of years, the, the husband came in one Sunday to church and was telling me about this job op opportunity that he, that he had been offered, this, this incredible promotion that he'd been offered. Um, it would require a, a significant move for the family, but it would be basically doubling his salary. And so he was talking about how excited he was. Basically, the decision had already been made. And he was talking about how they were going you know, to move into this new city, you know, to all, all of this different stuff. And I remember asking him, like, hey, so like, just out of curiosity, like, have you, have you, I know, I know you've got the job. I know you've already looked at houses. I know you've looked at schools. Have you thought about finding a church there yet? And he goes, ah, that'll, that, that, that'll, that'll, that'll happen. Like, well, like, don't, don't you worry. Like, like, we're, like, we're good at finding a church site. Like, the, like, I kind of answered in a way that really made it seem like this hadn't been something that he had even kind of thought about. And so they, 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 they he took the job, they moved, you know, they, they moved and, and you know, again, it was a fa fantastic job opportunity and there was good schools and everything like that for the kids. And six months later, I, I, I saw him, he came back into town and he actually came into town for, for, to, for something for work. And while he was there, he stopped into the office of church and he actually came into, into, into our office and into, into my office. And I said, how's it, you know, how's it going? And he, and, he, and he shut the door behind him, which is not something that usually, usually happens if people are about to tell you that things are going really well. He shut the door behind him. He said, you remember when you asked that dumb question six months ago about us finding a church? And I said, yeah. He said, well, I thought that was such a dumb question. I still hate that you asked it. But he said, Chris, we're miserable. Like we're making more money than we've ever had. We're in a better house than we've ever lived in our entire lives. But our kids are miserable. My wife and I are fighting more than we've ever fought in our entire lives. Like things are just not going well. And I and I asked him, like, have have you found a church where where, where you're living now? He said, he said, I knew you were gonna ask that. Like we were so connected to a church here, and we thought the church here was so great. We compare every church we walk into that to, to, to the church here, and nothing feels right, and nothing feels like home, and so we haven't found one, and we're just we just we're just not go, going anywhere, we're not really paying any attention to, to God right now. And, and, I, and, and we sat down and we, and we prayed together. We, we cried together because this is a family. Again, we, we just love this family. And, I, and after we prayed, I said to him, look, here's the thing. The reason that you're miserable right now is not because you made a wrong decision to move. 
the reason you're miserable right now is because you put God, is because in order to move, you put God on the back. When you move, you put God on the back burner. You've gotten your priorities out of order. You thought it was the kids and the job and the salary and the house and all of that kind of stuff. And you thought the God stuff would just kind of take care of itself while you got everything else figured out and squared away. And what you need to do is you need to put God back on the front burner because let's be honest, we all know there are some burners that are better on your stove. You need to put God back on the front burner because until God's on the front burner, until you're paying attention to the things of God and focusing on the things of God, nothing else in your life is going to work right. And you already know that. He went, you're, abs- you're, ab- you're absolutely right. So he headed, he headed back, back home, and I, I saw him again six months later when he was back for work because he came back every six months or so. And I said, how's, how's, how's it going? He goes, it's going so much better. He's like, when I got back, I talked to my wife. I said, we need to find and pick and just, just pick a church. Like, we don't need to find the perfect church. We just need to decide to make the church, whatever church we go to, to make it better. Like, we just need, we don't need to stop comparing it to where we've been. We just need to pick a church and get involved and get plugged in because we need to focus on the things of God. He said, when I said that to my wife, my wife broke down because it's what she had been praying I would come home saying. So we, he's like, we've gotten involved. Our kids are involved. We're, both, we're, we're in a small group with people that we're starting to really like and, just, and starting to get to know as family. He said, I, he said, I'm so glad that we decided to put the stuff of God back on the front burner. He's like, if, if we had never done that, I don't know where we'd be today, but we put it back on the front burner and the last six months have been far better than the six months before it. Now here's the thing, at the end of the day, this is the temptation we face to move God to the back burner in order to get the things that we think God would have us have for us in the first place. And when we face that temptation, ultimately, the choice is will we trust our Heavenly Father to be our source, that if He has a will for us, He has a way for us. If He has a will, He has a way. If He has a plan for us, He has a way to provide. And that we can either take matters into our own hands and take a shortcut or pursue it at the wrong time in the wrong way, or we can trust God's timing, we can trust God's way, that He ultimately has and ultimately is what's right for us every step of the way of our lives. See, every time you're tempted, your trust in God is tested, not just your self-control. Every time you're tempted, you find out who you are and ultimately you find out whose you are, who you ultimately belong to. Don't choose what's immediate over the one who is ultimate and over the one who is most important. Choose the one who's working in you and on you while he's working for you. Choose to trust the one who carried you here, that he will continue to carry you there. Choose to trust that you don't need to take things into your own hands when he has you in his hands. Choose to trust him. That's how we grow our resistance against temptation. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for this example once again from Jesus. Thank you Thank you for, for his willingness to resist temptation, his willingness to, to resist the urge to take the shortcut and to, and to get what he came for without doing everything that he came for. God, thank you that he chose the cross. Thank you that, thank you that he chose to pay for our sins, not just to pursue authority. And God, I thank you that he set an example and a tone of, uh, for us of what it looks like to ultimately trust in your will and to trust in your way and trust in your ability to provide and your ability ability to see us through to the things that you have for us. God, thank you for that example. Help us to follow it. Help us all to have wisdom to know what to do with what we just heard. Help us to have the courage to actually put it into practice starting today. We love you, God. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.
praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what living feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom Break down every wall. We'll watch the giants roll. You cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift Him high. With all creation cries, God, we praise you. Oh, we praise you. praise you
What a great time we've had together today. Thank you for being with us. Before you log off and go about the rest of your day, there are a few things that we want to mention. First, we want to make space today for generosity. We have our two methods available that you can give. You can text 84321 with a dollar sign and the amount you want to give, or visit our website, mvmnt.church giving, and you can give online. Thank you for giving. Next, we would love to be able to pray with you in any need that you may be facing. You can message us on Facebook, you can call us or send us an email so that we might be able to help with that need or pray with you in any way that we can. Lastly, parents, we have our weekly kids videos available right now on Facebook or YouTube for you and your children to enjoy together as a family. That's all we have for you today. Thank you so much for being with us and until next time, keep being the movement.